Geopolitics and Empire is joined by behavioral scientist Patrick Fagan. He has over a decade's experience applying psychology to influencing behavior in the real world. He's a guest lecturer at London Universities, publishes peer-reviewed papers, and contributes to publications such as the BBC and Spectator. He's the author of Hooked, Why Cute Cells and Other Marketing Magic That We Just Can't Resist. He was previously lead psychologist at Cambridge Analytica, and now he works at Capuchin. Thank you for joining the podcast, Patrick. How is life in the UK in the new normal, or shall we say new abnormal? Yeah, hi. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, life in the UK is uh, grey, as usual, um, but it's also uh, with the added um, greyness of uh, oppression. I'm not sure what's going down the pipe. So the restaurants and things are open, which is good. But for me, at least, there's kind of an impending sense of doom with this mid to late September date that many countries seem to be talking about. So um, enjoying it while it lasts. All right. Yeah, I kind of I kind of feel uh, the same. Before I get to my first question, though, I just want to remind listeners to subscribe to the Geopolitics and Empire email list, Telegram channel, and everywhere else as I'm being censored. And I'm doing this full time now. So, so donations are not only appreciated, but uh, essential. So uh, I only recently discovered your work, Patrick, after you published an article for The Critic called Passport to Your Soul, where you say that opening the door to vaccine passports could lead to years uh, of oppression. This has been probably the single most important topic for me over the past year, uh, as I see it as the death knell for the freedom, democracy, and liberty, not just for Europeans or Americans, but for all mankind. Uh, I'll cite you know, Robert Kennedy Jr., who said that this is the first time in human history that we face such tyranny uh, on a global scale. Back in June 2020, so over a year ago, I interviewed the renowned Jewish historian Edwin Black, who, like you, I think you'll, you'll let us know your thoughts. He kind of describes this potential system or the potential of this system kind of like total oblivion. He compares it to what happened in Nazi Germany, and he calls it the algorithm ghetto, not unlike the Jewish ghetto, only a digital version of the equivalents. And recently, a Holocaust survivor, Vera Sharaf, has made similar comparisons. So my focus today is kind of on this digital passport, you know, based on your expertise in, in psychology and behavioral science, and not so much the crown virus, which is the pretext for bringing in the passport, uh, unless you wish to comment on that. So I would think that both people who believe the official narrative and who question it should be able to see the danger with these uh, passports. So start where you think it makes most sense, whether you wish to comment on the, the narrative of the past year and how our behavior has been influenced or on what this vaccine passport is exactly as you see it yeah i mean i think uh the ghetto's point is very interesting um uh, people have joked about kind of internet ghettos for a while you have places like gab for example um and it is worrying for two reasons number one is it's not like um people are allowed to go to gab and just do their own thing uh they're kind of actively hunted down and there's people trying to stop uh, Gab from existing and, and the founder, um, he's not allowed to use Visa anymore. And it's found, that's crazy. Like he, he's banned from using money, essentially. Um, and sure, I mean, I appreciate there's distasteful uh, opinions on Gab, but he hasn't broken any laws um, and they're going after him. So it, it's not, they're not content to live and let live. So that's the first scary thing. And then the second scary thing is, um, there's a quote, I'm paraphrasing, uh, where they burn books in the end, they will too burn people, something like that. So my concern is that this kind of online hysteria, witch hunts um, that you see on Twitter, if that spills over into real life, um, that's very concerning. Um, so that's really where my head is at and has been at um, for the whole pandemic. And I think the pandemic uh, is a symptom of a kind of deeper social and cultural malaise. I think um, the things weren't great before the pandemic. It's like, um, oh, we want to go back to normal. What, what do you mean? School shootings and um, drag queen story time for under fives and things like that. So I, I think things have been quite not normal for a while. Uh, the West, potentially the world, really globalist world is in decline or something strange is going on. Um, and so that's just been accelerated or exploited by the pandemic. Um, 
I've had COVID and it's not pleasant, but it is basically just the flu for most people. And the response seems completely disproportionate. Um, I don't think it's really anything to do with health. I don't think you can have a public health campaign where you stop people from socializing, exercising, getting sunlight, getting fresh air, where you bombard them with stress and fear for months on end, where you get them to cover up their breathing holes. Uh, this doesn't feel like a health campaign, um, maybe the opposite, really. Um, but anyway, from the start, just something felt off. You know, the statistics weren't really right, really basic things like they weren't doing per capita statistics. They weren't saying how many positive cases as a proportion of how many tests, because it was quite obvious, at least at the start, that they were doing more tests and as a result, getting more positive uh, cases. Um, so that was the first thing that clued me in. And then it's just been a bit uh, bonkers since then. Um, and they've, as, as a behavioral scientist, I've seen all of the uh, techniques that they've been using. This has been extremely obvious to me. And I will say, I'm not an epidemiologist. You know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to speak on that. I, this, I do believe this virus exists and it's unpleasant. And if you're old, sick or fat, it will, is a real threat to you. Um, but uh, what I am an expert on is manipulating people, the public, uh, social cohesion and politics and the fabric that ties people together and mental health. And on those three bases, I've been extremely worried about everything that's happening from the start. Um, before lockdown was even announced in the UK, I did a literature review, which means I searched Google Scholar <clears throat> for about an hour. I found all these papers where they looked at, for example, bases in Antarctica and simulated space missions and solitary confinement in prison. There's a huge amount of research on social isolation and confinement, which shows it's actually really, really bad for you in so many different ways. Uh, all the screen time that that kids are having now is really bad for them. Um, there's all this just really obvious stuff um, that's been happening that's not good for us. Um, so that's been my take on the pandemic, just concern at the nudges and manipulation that's being used, concern about the impact on social cohesion and uh, mental health. And um, whenever I, at least in the early days, tried to speak out about it, uh, people didn't want to hear it. Um, and that was also not good either. Uh, so it's been a quite um, challenging, uh, yeah, scary time, I think. Yeah, and I, I would say too that uh, back in December of 2019, um, I was living in Kazakhstan, so right near ground zero, right, w Wuhan, China, and my my family and I, we all got terribly sick and had strong symptoms of you know pneumonia or, or bronchitis, which we can't confirm if if it was COVID or, or not, but if it was, then you know we had it and we got over it. It, it was pretty bad, but again, we we got over it. Uh, and then you know I want to touch on. So this this passport now, which a lot of people are saying, so they're trying to introduce this digital COVID pass vaccine passport, uh, without which you basically won't be able to participate in society. And I'm hearing from different countries, different things like if you don't have this now, you won't be able to go into restaurants and cafes. I just heard from someone in Mexico that they were not able to renew their voting ID uh, it's called INE, which is the institution that issues your, your IFE, your like voter card, which people use basically as their ID in Mexico. They were not allowed in the building unless they showed a vaccine certificate. So it's getting pretty crazy. And so um, since you touched on it, I, I might as well start out with this kind of worst case scenario where we might be going and then kind of reverse engineer it ba uh, back, and which is what I tend to do. I kind of look at the worst case and then see how they're trying to take us there. So, you know, one question is, if you see this as the Chinese social credit system, and, and then I want to read a quote from your from your article, um, where you kind of describe a potential black mirror, worst case dystopian scenario of the, of the future. And I think we're already starting to get there, as I'm mentioning. So here's the quote. Uh, Imagine the year is 50 PR post reset. You're trying to get into an Amazon supermarket to buy a bug burger for dinner. The facial recognition software scans your face and flashes red. 
the door locks and denies you access. Your smartphone recently overheard you speaking critically of the government. You must go home and quarantine where your smart lock will only allow you out once it has been determined that you are no longer at risk of spreading these contagious ideas. You have to do your part to flatten the curve of viral misinformation. After all, it's for the greater good, end quote. So, you know, we see in China, thousands, if not millions of citizens are banned from buying train tickets, plane tickets, getting visas to leave the country, prohibited from getting good jobs or even getting a job at all, getting into higher uh, education. I personally met people in Kazakhstan who were banned from flying and had to take 50 hour train rides because of their political views and activism. In the US, Canada, and Europe now, uh, I can cite examples of law-abiding citizens who have had all their social media accounts terminated, including Airbnb for housing, Uber for transport. They, they've been put on a no-fly list. Their bank account has been terminated. You cited Andrew Torba of, of Gab. Uh, and this is all for their political or re religious views. It's happening now. And for me, this should speak for itself. You know, Just seeing this drives me crazy. And I think people should be in an uproar because it's going to happen to them next. You know, I've already had one financial account terminated. My Patreon, my Facebook's been muted. My YouTube has put me on strike. So I'm already a frog in the pot feeling the heat while the other frogs are enjoying what they think uh, is a sauna. So, I mean, your take on the vaccine passport, is it the social credit system? And how do you think it's going to develop? Um, I think uh, that you're right. There's all of these threads which are coming together, which make it quite clear where it's headed. Um, so total tracking and collecting of your data and using that to predict certain things about you, predict your future behavior, things that you might not even know about yourself. I mean, they can do that already. I mean, there was an example of Target, the retailer in the US, who predicted that a teenage girl was pregnant before her father knew, um, and they knew that based on her purchases on her loyalty card. And this that case study was about 10 years ago. Um, there's all sorts of things that they can do since then. I mean, Spotify uh, has a patent to listen to the ambient background noise uh, and kind of predict where you might be and how you might be feeling and send you targeted ads based on that. There's all sorts of research um, about how your digital footprint can be used to tell what your personality is. And that's fairly benign, but they can also, there was a famous Facebook-like study which found from Facebook likes it can predict your sexuality, if you use drugs, if you drink alcohol, if you're depressed. These are things which most people probably wouldn't want Mark Zuckerberg uh, to know, and not just to know, but to use against you because these things can be used to craft nudges, persuasive messages, um, which uh, can influence you better than just standard messages. Um, so if someone's really social, uh, they're more likely to be nudged by a positive kind of reward focused, um, exciting message. Um, and again, that's fairly benign, but if you start to be able to predict people's deepest insecurities, kinks, prejudices, um, then you can really manipulate them really in a very powerful Freudian kind of way. Um, and, and then there's just good old blackmail. I mean, everything that you've ever Googled or watched or done online or bought that's tracked somewhere. Um, there was, I talk in the article about this priest who, um, he, or, or a Monsignor, who was against uh, Biden uh, because of Biden's stance on abortion. And then a, a small Catholic blog apparently bought all of this very expensive uh, consumer data and did some very sophisticated analysis to be able to de-anonymize it. Uh, I mean, if you believe that they did that, you believe anything. But um, they basically found out that or reported that this Monsignor was using Grindr. Uh, and so he, like, his life was destroyed and he wasn't a threat to Biden anymore. Um, I myself was uh, in a chat group uh, that was like a private chat group um, and that got leaked and kind of tried to use against me fortunately I didn't say anything bad but they tried to to twist it any way they could um, so yeah we're really heading to quite a dangerous place where all of your data can be used against you so that's one of the threats and then the the other one is this crazy kind of schizophrenic um oppression of, of voices and silencing of people and this um, kind of mob mentality and witch hunts and things. Um, and uh, yeah, I think those two things coming together and, and 
the government, I mean, really, the danger of these vaccine passports is twofold. One is that it will make the state omniscient. So that means they'll know everything. They'll be able to read your mind, predict your behavior, know everything that you've done. And then the second thing is it will make them omnipotent because they can use that to allow you to use money or not, to survive or not. So they can make you do anything that they want you to do. Um, so it just seems inevitable. I mean, maybe I'm being cynical. Maybe, you know, the state is, the politicians are nicer and more considerate and more human than I'm giving them credit for. But I don't know, after the last year or so, I'm just not sure. I uh, I see. I'm. I, I guess people can call me a realist or, or or cynic. I see it the same way as it's kind of inevitable. I mean, my question is, how does everyone around us, you know, whether British people or I'm in Mexico, Mexicans or Europeans, or how do people find this like okay or or normal? I, I just can't mm -hmm. understand like the life we've li lived up until now. With you can go everywhere you like, with, do many things, and I don't understand how people kind of are on board with this? Um, I think there's, so I actually did a Twitter thread on why can people, did you see? Yeah. Well, why some people can see what's happening or what might happen and other people can't, other people can't. Um, I think there's a few reasons. I mean, obviously there's things like conformity where people just tend to follow the crowd. Um, there's a great video clip. I don't know if you saw it. There's people lining up for a vaccine center And then somebody gets wheeled past on a trolley having a seizure from the vaccine and the people just still are staying in the queue, not don't seem to be disturbed or anything by it. So um, we just tend to follow the crowd. We tend to believe authority figures. Um, there's those kind of things. Then on a deeper level, uh, what, what are we asking people to, to think and to face up to when we say that there's something going on. We're asking them to really face something quite terrifying and traumatic, which is, um, well, number one, that this hellish dystopia might be on the way. You know, a lot of people would rather at least subconsciously not face up to that. Um, number two, that people have been gullible and foolish to go along with this. Nobody wants to hear that. And number three, that uh, we're all dying eventually, we're all decaying, and all of these things which you think have protected you from death, the face masks, the social distancing, actually they haven't done anything and you're just as likely to die in the grand scheme of things as you ever were. So these are all things which we we don't like facing up to things that are really quite traumatic like that. <clears throat> um, I think, yeah, I think those are the, the main things. Um, And then on the other hand, the people who do see it in, in some studies I've done, uh, they seem to have some particular characteristics. So they're less, the, the main thing is they have lower need to belong, as you can probably imagine. Uh, we don't care if people don't like us. We don't care if we get kicked out of the group. Um, we, we also tend to be lower in agreeableness, which is often spun as a bad thing. They say that we're you know, psychopaths or what have you. I personally, of course, am biased. I think it's more about cooperativeness, which is less cooperative, less likely to conform and um, to not want to offend people. We're less like that. Um, we're also more likely to trust our gut. And if, if something feels wrong, we'll follow that instinct. And then one thing I found recently is that we're more likely to have strict authoritarian parents. Um, and that would not, you can, you can understand how someone who was raised that way might start to feel resentful against authority figures and questioning and suspicious. Um, and then also anecdotally, some people have raised the issue of kind of past trauma, whether that's um, being in an abusive relationship or uh, being touched by death in some way or going through addiction of some sort. That seems to be a common feature of people who are able to see what's happening for whatever reason. Yeah, that, that's an interesting final point that you mentioned, because I identify with a lot of that, especially that last point, because <laughs> in some ways I have faced, you know, seen close to death. And as a history major, I've, I've read about all of the horror stories of history and and I mean, from everything, you know, wars and, and details about how people die and, and, and torture. And it's like I've already been there mentally. So I've already faced that darkness. And so now yeah. I'm no longer afraid to deal with it. Uh, and now, and I, I, I've I've stared down the barrel of a gun. I've been held up in in, in Chicago, where I'm from, um, in, in other countries, in, in Mongolia. I've 
I've been held up with a broken vodka bottle, you know, um, mugged. Uh, and so I've been in these situations um, where I've already faced these nasty things and, and I'm no longer afraid to deal with. And as you say, a lot okay. of people, I think they've lived in this bubble their whole lives and they think, you know, everything's all right. And they don't understand the nature of, of, of evil, how it exists. They've never come, come face to face with it. So uh, there's a book called Political Pornology. Um, which is a bit of a tough read, but it has some good ideas in it. Um, so there's a few books and theories about how life goes in cycles. So we go through generational cycles. Um, 80, every 80 to 100 years, there's kind of a crisis. So we had you know, 80 to 100 years ago, we had Spanish flu, the Depression, and two world wars. Um, so it's you know, famine, plague, war, and death every 80 to 100 years. Um, but political panorology, he proposes that the cycle is that once the crisis is out of living memory, um, so once people who lived through it, have most of them have died, uh, we as a society are less, we don't think about it as much. We're less aware of the horrors that can exist and we're less able to spot psychopathic or sociopathic leaders. Um, and so we're more likely to vote them, more likely to follow them and so on. Yeah, and I think, yeah, that rings true. I can tell because I'm a history major. I'm obsessed with history and political science and international relations. So that's never gone away for me. That that memory of what happened, you know, World War One, World War Two. Uh, you know, my great grandfather died in World War One. My my grandfather I, was uh, a Nazi prisoner in Croatia, and so it's like, and I'm I'm reading about this constantly. So I've been able to spot this from the beginning, from over a year ago. Meanwhile, most people, you know, they don't, as you said, they've been detached, and on top of that, they don't read history, and so they don't see any of this. They, they just, you know, usually they talk about sports and cars and this mm. sort of thing, and, and they don't notice this. I, I kind of wanted to go back what you mentioned about, you know, um, big tech. You worked at Cambridge Analytica. I forget the details. That was some years ago about some scandal at, at Cambridge Analytica and, and stuff that was done. That I think that was um, illegal. And just kind of looking at What's going on now with the digital space, uh, big tech, what, what you were talking about, this nudging behavioral modification, uh, and as well what they're trying to do with the vaccine passports. It seems a lot what they're trying to do is just ram this stuff in, and it's quite uh, illegal. You know, I've taken a cursory look at documents such as the, the Mexican Constitution, the EU uh, you know, rights, human rights, the Nuremberg Code, UN Charter, UNESCO articles, and it seems that these digital passports across the board violate all of all of these charters, um, all of our dem democratic uh, rights, namely, you know, discrimination based on, on medical reasons or restriction of movement and such. Uh, I was telling you before the interview that, you know, one state in Mexico called uh, Mazatlan has made vaccine certificates mandatory for shopping, you know, to, to buy food. And some people have successfully used lawyers to obtain uh, exceptions based on the Mexican constitution, because there's an article that says you cannot discriminate people, um, you know, based on this article for, for medical reasons or, or other such reasons. So what they're clearly trying to implement is uh, illegal. And myself as a Croatian citizen, uh, EU citizen, you can find in the EU articles as well that you cannot restrict, you know, people's movements and such but the eu just came out with their green pass so you know what are your thoughts on on big tech and and governments trying you know violating uh, our rights mm -hmm. yeah that's one thing that really worries me is why are they being so uh desperate why are they forcing and pushing this so much because if you look at the evolution of technology it feels like it was kind of going this way anyway i remember a lo-fi documentary i saw maybe 15 years ago called um, Zeitgeist and the uh, which is great it really changed my view on things um, which I agree with all of it uh, but um, it culminated by saying that the goal was to get people tracked uh, digital currency uh, everything you do you won't be able to 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 take part in society you won't be able to um, buy and sell unless you're tracked with this thing and um, that was 15 years ago and and you know, they haven't had to forcibly track people because uh, smartphones came along and people kind of wanted it and they've gone along with it. So it seemed like the evolution of that was quite slow and it was happening and no one was upset. And now they're forcing it uh, really quite 
brutally on people to the point where you have millions of people around the world protesting this huge protest movement now so that's one thing that worries me is why are they so keen to force it so quickly i don't know um so what was uh, what was the other question sorry no just just this you know in, in general how how big tech uh, and, and governments have been behaving you know on the border between legal and, and yeah. illegal you know whether it's it's facebook um or, or, or Twitter or or because or, or, you know Google they're, they're all involved you know IBM and Google and Microsoft are involved in developing these passports uh, we, we've seen them you know take down the president of the United States uh, all of his accounts yeah. which seemingly mm -hmm. goes against free, free speech so I don't know if you had any other thought on how basically like big tech the how the corporations are working together with governments now which is basically the definition of the fascism and how big tech has become more powerful financially um, and politically than the nation states uh, themselves. And it's like now yeah. they're this oligarchy that's above the nation state doing what they want with us. Yeah, I mean, I used to like um, Trump quite a lot. Don't tell anyone. Um, so I've seen, I've seen this coming for a while, for like five years, people getting banned, subreddits getting banned, um, all sorts of people. And it starts off with the things that you don't find objectionable. You know, no one's going to defend... Uh, racist anti-Semites, but um, is this mission creep where it's just actually getting to quite reasonable people now being affected by it. And with coronavirus, doctors are unable to say what they think. That's incredibly dangerous um, and nonsensical to be banning uh, these voices because they don't agree with the narrative because they're uncomfortable. Um, so yeah and so i've seen it i've seen it the media collusion as well it's not just big tech it's the media um you you can see them running stories in tandem all of these media outlets saying the same thing which doesn't have any relation to truth um i realized they're more concerned with creating narratives than telling the truth um so they're more about building stories um and big tech yeah absolutely and you, you may know the um search engine manipulation effects like google that that as well yeah i've, I've interviewed dr robert epstein who was oh, know, great. the top expert on that and so yeah yeah um and so another aspect of this vaccine passport I, I, a lot of people are asking me now you know they're being pressured you know i've got people all around me who are being pressured by their work to, to get in um injected and you know the, the question itself isn't about again you know the vaccine or injection it's the, the way i see it is you know whether you play the the, the digital passport game or, or you don't there's no in between because if you start playing the game it seems what they've already said it's going to be forever uh annually mm -hmm. you'll need to take injections or otherwise yeah. your, your digital passport will be deactivated we've seen canada just bought made like a five-year deal um with Pfizer, the EU has done the same for the next four or five years for all of its 500 million population. So they're expecting every citizen now to annually get these uh, injections. It's a big money making scheme. I also recall reading an article from Kazakhstan uh, where I used to live and where they've already introduced the passport. So you can't go into cafes without mm -hmm. downloading the app. Uh, and it has a green status and a red status. To get the green status, you need to have, you know, take the negative take the test and have a negative test or take the vaccine and then that allows you to go into the cafe uh, if you don't have a smartphone you, you can't enter because you have to scan the qr code to enter uh and if you haven't taken the injection or um gotten a test that's negative you also have a red status but the article said that even if you do get injected um you might still get a red status without explanation so that mm -hmm. kind of goes back to what you're saying this mission creep where you know if if you're someone the government or corporate the corporations don't like they can just even if you follow these rules they can just give you a red status and you're blocked uh, out or the fact that every year now you have to be following these rules um so yeah. now now we're at the behest of the pharmaceutical industrial complex and it's kind of like you're, you're losing bodily autonomy and, and sovereignty yeah and don't forget of course uh how feckless and incompetent they can be um so imagine you know how helpless or unhelpful the government can be if they get your tax code wrong. Um, now apply that to being able to buy food to eat. You get denied, you don't know why, they don't know why, they keep sending you to department to department, eventually you starve to death. 
Um, that's that seems to be the future that we may be heading to. Um, but that's terrifying. Yeah, there's already here that you can't. I think in France you can't go to supermarket. I saw a video of that today. Um, so I, I think people have a choice. I think the old normal is dead, at least for now. And your choice is either submit to this thing or be free, but you won't have the luxuries that you used to have. Um, but in a way, I mean, it sounds kind of good to be homeschooling, growing your own food. I know it's difficult, and I don't mean to like um, fantasize, but is that necessarily a bad thing to be disconnected from this hedonistic kind of insane technological society? Maybe not. Yeah, I mean that, that reminds me. I mean, even way before all of this stuff, you know, years when I started first started the podcast, one of my first guests was this um, cultural historian Morris Berman, where he wrote a trilogy on the collapse of the U.S. empire and. He just like had enough, and a lot of his critiques had to do with this modern way of society. And he's moved down to here uh, to Mexico. I've met him, hung out with him uh, personally, did interviews with him a number of times, and so he's been talking about that for. There's a lot of there's this tradition of intellectuals talking about how we need to kind of step away from this consumerist, materialist, you know, crazy digital society and just kind of like get back into into nature. So. Um, Another question I had, from what I've gathered, it seems every single government, nation, country on the planet is on board with this mm -hmm. digital passport from, from yeah. Russia, China, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, the Americas. You know, I, I see no resistance. All major businesses now, corporations and even schools, education systems seem to be onboarding uh, as well. At my place of former uh, employment in, in Kazakhstan, it was a high school. Um, they've just, uh, I've seen pictures, um, you know, I stopped working there two months ago, but I've seen pictures now at the entrance, they've put in facial recognition systems. So you used to have a card that you used to, you know, go through the, what do you call it, turnstile. And, and now it's just your face. So now you just walk in, the facial recognition uh, recognize you. If you don't have a face mask, it doesn't open for you. Uh, and so basically now your face is how you gain entry. So, you know, how, how do you see, how is it that there's this, this is such alignment globally on, on these systems. Um, also, just to add, I don't know if you saw the World Economic Forum video recently where they talked about NASA developing technology that can identify you from your heartbeat. So even if you have your face covered, they know who you are. Um, I think there's two alternative explanations. I mean, you know, the mainstream one would be that there's a pandemic and we need to introduce these tools to fight it. Um, the two alternative hypotheses are one is um, just social proof and conformity and following the crowd. So a government sees another government implementing lockdowns and thinks, okay, I need to do that too. Everyone else is doing that. We should do that too. Um, then the other one is uh, that there is some kind of group that is deliberately pushing this. Um, and there's a document, I can't remember if it was the UN, uh, but they, you know, the lockstep document where they, they yeah, Rock about Rockefeller it. Foundation 2010. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and so that's exactly what's happening. I mean, in, I think it was like Greece, Israel, France, UK, maybe US, in about the same week, they talked about mandating or introduced mandatory vaccines for healthcare workers. And they introduced some form of digital passport. And these are all different countries, different politicians, political parties. Um, but they're all doing exactly the same thing. And so at that point, it's like, what's the point in voting even? You, you get the same thing, whoever you vote for, whatever country you're in. Um, and what's the point in voting? And also, who's giving these these orders? And we can only kind of hypothesize, but I assume it's these NGOs. Yeah, like a after this whole year of pandemic, I've just kind of given up on democracy, republicanism, um, it's become a, a technocracy. I've been completely mm. disillusioned. And as you say, like nothing we do or say matters anymore. They're just making the decisions uh, across the board that are not constitutional in, in countries. So it's just like, I, I don't care anymore <laughs> in one sense about politics because, and I've a number of some of my guests, experts uh, as well have said that democracy is dead, that historically we've, Democracy has has passed globally, basically, especially in the West. 
And that, you know, Gre Gregory Copley, who I've interviewed, has said this, that so now we're entering into some other age of increased authoritarianism. And that's kind of what we're seeing. So th this can be confirmed. Yeah. Do you see any way of stopping this now? I mean, the only way I see is if we reach a, there's a critical mass of people that stop complying, non-compliance. Like here in Mexico, if I'm not mistaken, uh, many, p the, the government wanted to continue this great reset, fourth industrial revolution way of schooling, right? Virtual remote online schooling, which I can tell you as a teacher sucks, you know, for, for students, yeah, it's, yeah. it's horrible for teachers. It's horrible. It's very low uh, quality. You can't compare it to in-person uh, learning and, and, and teaching. And so the government here in Mexico wanted to continue to keep schools closed down, but men, a mass of parents, many different states are saying, no, it's logical because they see it's low quality. They also have to work, you know, they can't have kids. It creates so many problems. So the parents pushed back and the Mexican government said, okay, we'll open the schools. So that's one example of a critical okay. mass pushing back. And so that's the only solution that, that I see. Do you, do you see any way of trying to stop these digital passports? Um, I think it's obviously I've thought about this a lot and I've been involved with groups as much as I can um, to, to kind of oppose this. Um, I think... I personally subscribe to the view that, that this is a huge social trend. It's like, um, as I say, this cycle that goes around every 80 to 100 years, and there's not really much you can do except uh, try and wait it out. Um, so I feel like people who are really out there fighting it are a bit like people standing on the beach saying, there's a tsunami coming. Um, it's like, run, get off the beach. Um, but that's just me. I mean, having said that, I'm still doing everything I can within reason to, to, to oppose this stuff. I think ultimately it comes down to it's an individual spiritual kind of rebellion. It's up to each person to have this kind of awakening and you can't force it on everyone. Um, so, I mean, what, you's, what you've talked about sounds great. And I think we've seen examples like that here in uh, the UK in terms of, um, I don't know, it felt like we had a victory of vaccine passports. Um, but this is the point that it always seems to be two steps forward, one step back. So maybe they did concede on this, this schools thing, but they'll just come back with something else. They're patient. They wait years and decades to enact their plans. So I don't know. I don't mean to be pessimistic, but I I don't think it is a pessimistic thing. I think it's an individual thing. If each person can just do the right thing and be like uh, Pavel's greengrocer, you know, in um, uh, Power of the Powerless, uh, uh, Havel, I think, uh, he became the president of, I want to say, uh, the Czech Republic eventually. But anyway, he he lived under communist rule and he, had, he, he talked about you as an individual have the power uh, to go along with this or not. He said, live not by lies. And I think that's the number one thing, which actually is very difficult for people to do in their daily life, but just stand up, uh, just tell the truth and live the truth. Um, and if, if a sizable number of people did that, um, then, then it would be unstoppable, really. Um, and with the vaccine passports, you have a huge amount of power in your hands as an individual to not use it. And okay, you might not be able to go on flights or go in restaurants for a while. It's going to be difficult, but this requires some kind of personal sacrifice in the short term to have a better future for our children and our children's children. So it's going to be difficult, but if you just do the right thing and don't use it and just say no, that's such a huge, massive power. Um, and I think that that feels to me like the solution. I, again, I see eye to eye with you. I've, I've actually, over the past year, been using exactly that phrase, two steps forward, uh, uh, one step back is what, what they've been um, doing. And so that kind of brings me kind of to my next question. Well, you know, if this is then inevitable as, as you see it, and I, I see it this way as well, and I, I've kind of switched my tune as well, as you said, the people on the beach saying there's a tsunami coming, I've gotten tired of that. And I'm just kind of like, seeing what I can do for myself at home to kind of prepare for this, you know, hard road ahead because I'm not plugging into the system. So as you say now, pretty soon I might not be able to go into supermarket here. So I'm already, they have supermarkets now that deliver uh, 
online. So I know that's not a long term option, but you know, mm. so so if I can't go into the supermarket, at least there's a company that will bring you the, the food you need, uh, deliver yeah. it, fresh fr- produce and stuff to to your home, and then later on, if you can, you get some plot of land or with a friend yeah. grow food. Uh, but then, what, how would you? What would you recommend? And the question is, how long this is going to last? Right? You said to to wait it out. We don't know how long this this could last. I mean, what if it gets installed and it lasts for years, for decades? Mm-hmm. How do you survive life in such a scenario? Then, what's a recommendation you might have? I think the Amish have been around for a while and they're, they're doing okay. So that's kind of how I see my my life as like the new Amish. Um, I'm happy with that. They seem very happy, actually, very healthy, happy people. The Amish, um, and I, yeah, I'm doing everything I can to try and reduce my dependency i mean i still live in a a london apartment for now but um i'm using like i deleted my amazon account recently that was liberating i deleted netflix and everything uh quite a while ago i use a dumb phone as much as i can and put my smartphone in a faraday bag um so it can't connect with the outside world at all um so how long will it last Obviously, I have no idea. If you want to go the esoteric route and talk about these cycles, um, probably, I mean, if you look at the younger generation, like Gen Z, they are not all there, (laughs) if you see what I mean. Uh, That's a very broad generalization, but you see these videos uh, on TikTok, and some of them are absolutely nuts, and they will eventually uh, get into the reins of power and that's going to be a very uncomfortable time. However, from an esoteric point of view, Gen Z is, of course, the last generation of something. It's Z, and then Gen Generation Alpha is the new one. So that's not scientific by any means, but that's kind of the the timeline I'm thinking is that Gen Z get into in, get into power in the next what if the next twenty years or so. There'll be a crisis then, um, and then then that will be averted eventually and things will settle down a bit. Um, so I'm thinking, yeah, a few decades. And just to comment on the, on the Neo uh, Amish, you know, I, I used to live uh, in the Gobi Desert in, in Mongolia in a village of less than a thousand people, uh, you know, outside of the village for hundreds of kilometers. And absolutely nothing. You're in, in the freaking desert. And I was living in the yurt, you know, what, the, what Mongols have been living in for over a thousand years. And I absolutely loved it. And I had someone, a European friend of mine, you know, th- this was over a decade ago, asked me, how is it, you know, living with those poor, you know, Mongolians in, in, the, in the yurt, in, in the desert? And I was, just, I was offended, actually, because I, I've been around wealthy people, you know, where I used to work in Mexico, schools, kids that come from super wealthy backgrounds. And and you see all, a, a lot of broken so people who are you know extremely wealthy they come from broken homes um they're very materialistic and they're depressed they have psychological issues yet these people that i lived with in mongolia happy people content they have all their basic needs met and they're happier uh than a lot of the people in the western world and and i prefer to be with people who are happier and content uh like that who have less material wealth than these people have big problems in in the urban cosmopolitan world. Um, I don't know if you have any final thought uh, for us. Um, uh, Well, I was just going to say my friend works with some of the richest of the rich type people for his profession. And yeah, he, he echoed the exact same sentiment that actually they're not better off uh, in terms of mental health and so on. Um, And you know, as a society, uh, we don't really place much emphasis on spiritual health, and that doesn't necessarily need to be religion, but it's just uh, like having integrity, uh, getting back to nature, clearing your mind. Um, we are seeing a trend towards things like meditation and mindfulness, but um, these things are actually really important, and somewhere along the way, we've forgotten that, and people have become quite, um, and I was certainly like this, so it's not a judgment, but kind of empty and hollow. Um T.S. Eliot wrote a poem, The Hollow Men, uh, Heads Filled with Straw. Um, And the thing about nihilists isn't that they don't believe anything, it's that they will believe anything. Uh, They'll they'll believe everything. So um, if you don't have a solid structure and foundation, 
spiritually, psychologically, whatever, your uh, nature abhors a vacuum. And so there's a vulnerability that some other ideology will come in and make you feel safe and give you a purpose and give you a place to belong. Um, I think that's kind of what we're seeing at the minute, for example, with uh, coronavirus, um, how quickly people have jumped into this kind of bit of a cult, really, of face masks and hand washing and things um, because they don't have that heritage community um, purpose. Uh, so, yeah, I think final thoughts is science is great. I don't want to denigrate science, but there, there is a whole other aspect, which actually I think would make us a lot healthier and happier. The friendly thing you mentioned about this cult mentality where I've, I'm even seeing it with religious and Christian people who are falling into the yeah. ma masks and, and, and hand gel and all, and all of that. It's like you see people all over the place going like this and like the gel's bad for you. It's got, you know, yeah. th there, it was reported there were actually like seven people that died in Mexico from using gel that had toxic stuff in it. So it's like. Um, well, there's research as well that it um, made mice sterile. I mean, it's a sterilizing chemical, so it would. I think if you're using it every now and then, it's fine. But these people who are obsessively rubbing it into the pores of their skin it can't be good. Um, and there's a huge religious connotation potentially to these things like face veils, washing your hands, isolation from other people. These are all things that you find with religious rites. Um, so whether that's deliberate, preparing people for a rebirth, a reset, or whether that's just kind of forced up from the collective unconscious i don't know but it seems to be a lot of religious overtones with what's happening hey, you mentioned the hollow man that reminds me of another fellow british uh musician frank turner who so who talks about hollow man i think it's in the song called sons of liberty i'm not sure but in, in any case uh your website is patrickfagan.co.uk you're on twitter at pf pfagan87 and yeah. people can get your 2016 book hook um hooked Uh, I guess not an app. Well, they can get it on Amazon and elsewhere. Is there any other website? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there... No, actually, I don't think so. I mean, please Google it. Try not to use Amazon if you can. All right. Um, please follow Patrick Fagan's important work. Find him on, on Twitter. I, uh, again, I just subscribed to your Twitter and you've got a lot of amazing stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing and, and, and tweeting uh, your, your material uh, from Twitter and uh, check out his website and check out his book. And thank you, Patrick, for being on Geopolitics and Empire. Pleasure. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast interview. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up for the free email list through which you can receive an update of every new podcast, as well as a long list of key news headlines once a week. We're being heavily censored. YouTube has deleted some of our videos, and we currently have one strike. Patreon has terminated our account. Facebook has restricted our page and Reddit has been the leading posts. Our favorite social media channels are Telegram and Twitter. The best places to watch the podcast beyond YouTube are on Odyssey, BitChute, and Brighteon. The best places to listen to the podcast are on SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, Google, or on any other podcast app. To help keep this podcast alive, Leave a review on Apple Podcasts and wherever else. Subscribe to all our platforms and leave a donation if possible via Subscribestar, PayPal, Bitcoin, or Ethereum. You can also find us on MeWe, Minds, Gab, Float, VK, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Thanks for listening.